I have a little bit of a froggy voice. I had the flu last week. Yeah. How many of you have had the flu this year? Yeah. So many people have been sick this year. I think because we're finally out and about and getting together and hugging and. Well, it hasn't. Uh, you know, we haven't been, so our, our immune system is like. Yeah. Yeah. So I, if I sound weird, it's good to that. You sound wonderful as always. So, you know, I would love to talk to you for forever about everything. You know more about me than that my husband you. knows. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So I'm going to open this. This is in my career. Yeah. That is true. <laughs> so I'm going to open this up. I would love to know about your experiences on your very short um, stint on American Horror Story. Well. I actually worked on American Horror Story for six years. Um, Dawn. Oh, our, uh -oh. <laughs> our makeup effects company, AFX Studio, started working uh, on the Freak Show, mm -hmm. and then all the way through um, 1984. So that was a lot of seasons of that. And so Hotel, Apocalypse, Cult, Roanoke, all of those seasons, we did all the makeup effects for those shows. So I've been working on those for a long time as, you know, the, I'm kind of, I'd call myself like the CFO of our company, AFX Studio. I do all the payroll and I do all the insurance, all the taxes, I do all that kind of stuff. You keep it all running. I keep it all running. And so there was an opportunity when they were doing Freak Show there was this Tupperware lady scene, and the scene was very elaborate. It, you know, um, what was the name? Dandy? No, what was the name of the character? Um, yeah, Dandy. That's been Whitrock. Dandy Mott. Yes, Dandy. Yeah, so he is, you know, I think he was the murderer. Anyway, he came in and he slit all he of our throats. He was not a good guy. No, <laughs> he was slitting all of our throats while we were at a Tupperware party. And there's something about it that just, I said, I really want to be in this scene, and I really want to have this happen to me. So we spent the whole day in New Orleans. We all got our neck appliances put on. Well, first we had to do a scene where we're just politely listening to Kathy Bates talk about, don't be like a Tupperware. Don't let your husbands like put you in Tupperware like you are. It was a very feminist mm -hmm. speech. You've ever chance to listen to the show. It's so inspired, because Kathy Bates, of course, is like one of my heroes. So that was also the reason I wanted to just be on the set with her. and So I'm in the very, very deep background. And, you know, I was an extra basically, but it was uh, very exciting. And at the end of the day, we all were floating in the swimming pool. We all had our necks, uh, neck appliances on and we're all, you know, slashed floating in the pool. So it was a whole day and night of being in a swimming pool and very cold very hard to do. And then, of course, the final scene in the show is like, cut one person with a flash check and that's it. They don't even see us. And it was pretty disappointing to see how they actually put the scene together. Because in my mind, it was much more magnificent, I think, than what ended up being on TV. But so that's the way it is in film a lot. You work really hard on scenes and you spend a lot of time getting into makeup, and you sit on the set a long time waiting for your time to come up, especially if you're an extra. And then, you know, often you're cut completely. So, um, you know, you just have to be ready for that. And just enjoy the moments that you have on the set, really like soaking it all in and enjoying the company of the people that are, you know, so talented around you. So, you know, I got to meet Sarah Paulson um, on that show. I, I worked with, yeah, Finn. Um, they would come to the shop for their uh, life cast. Uh, Alexandra Rosario, is that her name? Alexandra? Alessandra? Alex, uh, anyway, she's so beautiful. Daddario. Blue eyes, Daddario. We did makeup for her. And so getting to meet them in the lab, usually we were taking life casts and um, making them comfortable, you know, and having a good time. So being on that side of the camera is a lot more uh, you know, it's just a lot more technical, a lot of hard work and deadlines, trying to get stuff ready. That show, I think they shot an episode every nine days, so it was fast and furious. Our whole crew is so good, and um, you know, basically, we get the script and it says, 
we need, uh, what was one of the good things we needed? Oh, we needed like in Roanoke, this guy gets his guts pulled out all the yeah. way across the room. Did anybody see that scene? It was oh, yeah. really great. So we brought that guy in and took his, you know, took his measurements and then we had to make this special, um, it's kind of like a girdle basically that was packed with all of the intestines under the clothes and then there was a way that it could be slashed open and then pulled out. So I mean, every every day literally there was some gag that had to be designed and budgeted and then you know turned around and it was so exciting. We really loved working on that show. But then after a while, you know, killing teenagers, we decided we just didn't really love doing that anymore. And um, I always tell the story like the last day that I mean we kind of quit because this day happened where it was on 1984 where um, these two kids come in and they have to get killed like a knife through their heads while they're kissing. And um, it was super um, awkward because these two kids never met each other. We're like, okay, you gotta pretend to be kissing. And, and you know, we had to figure out like where the knife was gonna go. And they're like, have to lay on this table. I mean, it was just so awkward. And then the next gal that came in didn't know that she was gonna die in the show. And she just burst into tears when we show, told her that we were you know, basically murdering her in the show. And she's like, I told my grandma that I was on American Horror Story, and, and now you're telling me I'm gonna die like right away? And we're like, yeah, sorry. You know, and, and she had a boat paddle like, shoved down her throat. So that was <laughs> really heartbreaking to me because I was a young actor one time, and I would go in, and you're not really sure what you're gonna do. Like Nightmare on Elm Street never had any concept of what I was going to be asked to do in that movie and and then you just saw her heartbreaking because she thought this was going to be her big break or she didn't have like a future on the show and I had to kind of break it to her like that's it so after that we just got really kind of tired of doing that and and then we realized we needed to move on so we let some other we let um, Vincent um, Vincent Van Dyke he took over after after we finished so he's it's a good hand for the longest time, American Horror Story, I don't have cable, but American Horror Story was my birthday tradition because they would release the DVDs on a, birthday. A, well, about two or three weeks before. So I pre order it, I'd get it, save it, and my birthday's in December. And okay. then my husband and I would binge the, take my day off for my birthday and binge the entire thing. Whoa, that's that was my birthday hardcore. tradition. Hardcore. <laughs> I don't think I can do it. Well, I, I, like, I don't like horror, so I'm like, watching yes. like this. Well, the best part was it's like I didn't have to get dressed or put shoes on or do anything. I, I always say that Ryan Murphy, he had this way of like breaking every taboo. Like if there's a taboo against killing babies, like he'll do it. If yes. there's a taboo against, you know, stabbing women in certain places, like he'll do it. You know, it's like, it, it was a really, um, it was a time in America where people are still always pushing the envelope, always pushing the envelope. And I felt that Ryan Murphy is really good at it. Yeah. But the stories too, they're so the stories are so good. Yeah, they're so good. Yeah. Then I'm gonna talk about effects one more time before I turn it into the audience. I really love the effects you guys did for Kevin and Yeah, that yeah. was one of our favorites that ever of all time. So stellar. No matter how you feel about the movie, you have to admit that the all, effects are all the monsters were yeah. fantastic. Do you have a favorite? Monster, um, well, I think um, the um, I forget his name. It's like the whale, like the whale, the, with the blowhole. There was so the many blood at the end. Yeah, it, it was a, a homage to the, the yeah, the merman. The that's merman. what we call him in that. So, um, yeah, all of the creatures that we made were trying to be like looking back towards past monsters of the past. So they weren't exact ripoffs, but they were kind of inspired by a lot of the the universal monsters or the monsters that we had all grown up with or that our parents had grown up with really. And so they had a tall order. We had to make like over a hundred different kinds of creatures. So we had a blob, you know, we had we had things that, you know, you could recognize. Um, and it had to be on a fast schedule. We only had three months to actually produce all of those monsters. So um, it was, fast and furious and we had the best artists in LA working for us and I think there had been a lull, it was a global financial crisis and so a lot of shops like were struggling 
and a lot of people were let go, and so we had the chance to pretty much hire like you know Norman Cabrera. Um, oh gosh, I mean I can't even remember everybody's name, but uh, everybody who had a you know had some free time came and jumped on that film. The, the werewolf, of course, was really classic too. Yeah. The werewolf. I mean, people who know me know that the ballerine, the dentata, has to be my oh, favorite. But yes. was that inspired by anything specific, or was that just like created in your brains? Well, that was created. Yeah, my husband designed that, and that, that ballerina girl was written in the script as you know, a ballerina who has teeth for her for her face, and you know, a lot of people have a fear of that kind of uh, you know teeth, and and it's also kind of inspired by art. There's some art that involves kind of those spiky little teeth like that, and. Um, yeah, so my husband created that sculpture for a young girl, uh, Jodell, and she was at some of the shows last year, and I, I saw her again, and she was blind the entire day. I think there was like one tiny little hole that you can kind of see a little bit out of, but she basically, she did do all that ballet work totally really? blind, yeah. I didn't know that was her in that costume, because she was yeah. in the other parts, too. No, 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 you're right. Jodell played the other little girl, yeah. the Buckner. Um, right. Um, uh, Prudence, yes. No. I can't remember who was the ballerina girl, but anyway, she was a young dancer and she did an amazing and job. She danced blind. Danced blind. It's so yeah. hard. Yeah. So, so like, have balance. You're Just think about balance. it. Try to do a pirouette when you're blindfolded. Yeah. You have no idea where you're at. Yeah. Wow. So lots of great adventures. That's amazing. That. Yeah. Oh my God. Do we have any audience questions? Hi. Hey, Heather. Oh. Can we all like say happy birthday to Elena? One, two, three. Happy birthday, Elena! Okay. <laughs> My question is actually about Nightmare One, and it's kind of like a random question, but you know nowadays when the film ends and there's like a huge twist at the end, everybody goes straight to the internet and goes, what's the meaning of this ending? Right. Can you explain the ending? What was it like for you back then? Because I'm sure you didn't have some. The internet. Yeah. So yeah, her question is the ending of Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, there's so many interpretations, and we didn't have the internet where you could just type in, you know, what do you think that ending meant, and talk to everybody around the world. So you know, I always had my own thought about what the ending meant. To me, I always felt that Nancy really did wake up, and then uh, I kind of it, it kind of was like a Nightmare Seven concept where she really did wake up but then Freddie was there in her real life. And so that's how I had interpreted it. But then a lot of people just thought, oh, she never woke up from her dream. It's just an extension of that night before when she is having you know, a terrible nightmare. So the whole literally third act is actually just a dream, even playing the booby trap. So like everybody had their own idea. And I do feel like um, it wasn't as big of a deal to, to not like know how the ending was, but now I do feel like people really want to like really examine it. We talk about movies a lot more than we did back then. I think we would see a movie, we would kind of go, "That was a really great movie," and I really love Freddy, but it didn't get that deep. And now that we have a chance to discuss it all the time online with our friends or even at these shows, uh, people are getting a lot more observant, they're getting a lot more. Well, also, back, back then, you didn't really have the ability to just pull it up on demand and watch it anytime you want and examine yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, if you didn't see it in the theater, you are kind of out of luck until uh, VCRs were invented. Mm -hmm. And then once VCRs were invented, you know, you had to kind of be able to afford a VCR mm -hmm. or you had to have cable, both of which were kind of expensive back then. So just seeing the movie over and over again wasn't really possible right. until maybe the last 20 years, maybe 15 years. I never met anybody who saw it dozens of times until recently, or you know, hundreds of times. I know. <laughs> the year was 1992. We had a VHS player. <laughs> How many people had a VHS player when yeah. they first came out? Yeah. So every we had a day. Betamax player too. <laughs> yeah. How many people like got cable, like yeah. when they were little kids? Yeah. So we did this funny thing with the cable, you know, um, a new sale would come out, so we'd get that premium channel that was on sale, and then we canceled after the three-month trial, and then another sale would come out for the different channel, and then we just like, yeah, your parents must have, or you must have been really organized, because I never remember when to stop the subscription, well, and then they just build my credit card. We were really poor, so yeah. it worked out, we had, were able to have the luxuries by taking advantage of the specials. Yeah, no, my parents And then they're like, really come back! Like, 
Yeah, no, we didn't. I was, you know, I was a child of the 70s, so. Yeah. No cable. 80s here, but yeah, for sure. Um, did I see one of yours somewhere? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So, New Nightmare, I think, was way ahead of its time. And I have read that it took some convincing to get you to sign up and do it the way Wes envisioned it. I don't know if that's entirely true, but I'm wondering what your thoughts were of putting, you know, more of Nancy onto the screen. I mean, more of Heather onto the screen. Yeah, I mean, I thought that the idea was so unusual. When I read the script, I just thought, oh, God, this is so crazy and unusual, never been done before. And I wasn't confident that it was going to be able to be done very well. But I did know that since Wes was going to direct it, that it was worth, you know, giving it a shot. But I always was uneasy about playing myself. I never loved, I never loved doing the scenes when I was myself. I always felt like it's a big compromise because it's not who I am at all. What Wes wrote, he wrote a Heather Langenkamp that, you know, services the thought of that story. And so I always like, why can't I be like have a better sense of humor? Why can't I laugh more? Can't we tell some jokes? You know, can't we? Like lighten this thing up, but you know, Wes has, you know, he knows everything about horror, and so he he knew that I was. I felt a little constrained, but you know, once we started, it was all systems go. Everybody was really uh, on board and and just really wanting to make it work. Because if it didn't work, we knew that we'd have a lot of egg on our face. You know, it'd be we didn't want Wes to fail, basically. So, and you know, he. He was so confident. He knew that it was a great idea. It was, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, uh, what are your thoughts on the future of Nightmare on Elm Street? Do you think that if, uh, if they ever came back to you to have some kind of sequel or you know, a future rendition of you, would you want to return? Or do you think that they're going to go in more of a route of like a TV show in the future? Well, you know, the almighty dollar like reigns supreme and I do know that um, whatever ideas they come up with, they'll probably want to make sure that they can be really um, profitable ideas and and so I just don't know what they're going to do, but if they did decide to do a sequel type of movie or, you know, that involved Nancy, of course I would play her. I think that she has more to offer the series as a either as Heather Langenkamp as an older woman or as a Nancy character who's like alive in some dreamland or whatever plot line they would come up with. I think, um, of course I would do it because I've invested this much of my life in that series. Why would I stop now? And, and I feel like the older I get, the better I get. I actually have learned a lot about being an actor. I don't, I mean, not that I made a lot of mistakes, but um, I just find different parts of my personality and uh, all the time and work on being an actor and being, you know, bringing new things to the screen. So I would love to do that, especially as Nancy. Were you ready to die in the series when you did? You know, I really was. I, I, I didn't really realize they were going to keep going on after part three. I was naive. I didn't realize, oh, this is like a juggernaut that's going to go on, you know, forever. Um, I always feel like in literature, there are certain um, traditions that if you abide by them, then your characters are actually stronger and more phenomenal, what would you say? Like, they really end up standing out for their sacrifice. And um, I think Nancy's death is a real moment in Nightmare 3 where you realize that the story is so much more than just, you know, this kids, you know, in the mental hospital. It takes such a turn to serious, like a really serious moment when Nancy dies and you realize that the, the cost of Freddy's uh, evil is extremely high. For some reason when you're killing off the little kids, I, I, we're like expecting it and you, and you feel like they're cannon fodder. You know, we're just bringing the kids into the storyline because we know some of them are gonna get killed. But when they brought Nancy in, she was brought in as somebody who could save them. And so when she dies, to me, it's a much more serious kind of moment. And uh, and there's that moment with she and Freddie where he's really like, he's really paying her back for a vendetta that he's had for her for a long time. Yes, back there. You know, uh, you're talking about your death in part three. Actually, um, I, I told you 
Is that true? Yeah, um, and, um, well, you know, people just, they've invested so much in Nancy, not just because she was in the first movie, but she's always been this, like, resistor, like this person who had the solution, like the person who was able to not let Freddie, you know, vanquish her. And so everyone has, has pinned so much of their hopes and dreams on Nancy for so long that when she, and he tricks her, by coming as her father, like it's so diabolical, knowing that she wanted to repair her relationship with her father, knowing that this is the one character that could actually probably let her guard down, like all of his methods, it's not just like a funny joke line for Freddie, he's actually really, it's a real betrayal, diabolical twist. And so all the people who said that they cried, it's just so unexpected. You know, you always think Nancy's gonna be able to make it, and she didn't. And I think that, you know, it's so human. Like, we always think we can beat it, but, you know, sadly, we all know we can't. Yes? All right, I'm asking a non- Non, okay, go for it. So how long were you in the seat to become Moto in Into Darkness? Oh, thank you. Yeah, so, um, yeah, J.J. Abrams was looking for a few more little alien characters for his movie. And uh, we actually had a spare alien character laying around the shop <laughs> that, I, that, that, that had been a test and I had worn it for another another movie actually. And they didn't make the movie and it was just a test. So David said, well, I've got this one makeup that Heather can wear, but only Heather can wear it. And, and they're like, yeah, we'd love it. You know, can we use it for Into Darkness? So my uh, father-in-law, Lance Anderson, who we call the ledge or legend, he applied it to me, and um, it took five hours. It was five pieces, and it's actually a really magnificent makeup. It um, not only do I wear that like kind of not watermelon head, but the, it's a froggy throat, and it glows up and lights up. And so when I was breathing in the scenes that you'll never see that were cut, you see me sitting at my little desk, and you see my frog thing come out, and I light up. And it's like the way this, this animal breathes. And it was super magnificent, but at that part of the movie, you know, it's very fast paced. They just didn't have a chance to kind of slow down to actually see that. And it's a shame because it really, really was a cool makeup. But it was five hours and I couldn't eat or drink or anything. It was like really hard to wear. Wow. Yeah, thank you. What was your first impressions of Robert and your reaction when you saw him in his full outfit? So I never saw Robert like uh, in his costume before the day we shot him. And Robert did only he only worked like six days on that film. <laughs> He's in the movie for six minutes. Okay, so I had seen Robert introduced to he got introduced to me. We kind of shared some you know kind words you know off the set, and he was not in makeup. And then the day that I'm, uh, I go downstairs in the school, after I've seen Tina and the body bag, I go down those stairs and I see Freddie for the first time. And, um, and so they had like a, first it was a wall and then it becomes like this curtain and he opens it up and he's there in this like steamy dungeon with all of the uh, makeup on. And it was so scary. I was like, oh, this is Freddy Krueger. Like, I had no idea this was gonna be a scary movie, really. I mean, I just, I, I just thought, oh, he's gonna be kind of like a weird old man who has a burn on his face or something like that. Like, I didn't really realize that what they were creating was such an iconic, evil dude. And I saw him and I did get chills. It was very scary. But then after that, you know, just seeing him on the set in his makeup and he's laughing and smiling and joking. It was just kind of a pleading moment, but I did really understand they created a really good character. Uh, anybody else? Anyone in the back? No, no, no. Oh, there's a. Oh, yeah. Piece. Piece. Yes, piece finally. Yes. Either one. We'll get to both of you. We'll get to both. Okay.
two, four, five, and six. I've watched them all, and um, you know, like I said, I'm just not a huge lover of horror, and so what I was always amazed about were just how the sets got so fantastical, like towards the end, like they get so imaginative and so crazy, and Freddy becomes like this kind of different, you know, monster all together. And, you know, I've met all of the women and men who played in these movies, and you know, they, they tell us the stories about how much fun they had or didn't have. And each director, you know, had his own take. That's what's so interesting about these movies is that each director really is so different in how they approach the whole movie. Um, I have to say, like, I, I couldn't say which one is my favorite, except I probably love the fourth one only because I just know all those people so well and over the years I've heard all their stories at Tuesday night and uh, Toy and Lisa, they really become like some of my favorite people. So I'd probably say that Nightmare 4 is my favorite of the sequels. And the next one in the back. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not as familiar with like your filmography or your uh, all the series that you started. So um, I, I just wanted to ask, did you start in those films really like guaranteeing these roles in any specific TV shows or other movies? Um, well, the most recent um, TV series that I was on is called The Midnight Club. Yeah. And it was uh, directed, well, and written by Mike Flanagan, who we all know from uh, Midnight Mass and Haunting of Hill House. And you recently did um, Fall of the House of Usher. And so he brought me on to play the, uh, I'm a doctor who owns a hospice for children with cancer. And as, and, and my place is really a place where they can kind of just like unhook from the medical system and these are people in the end stages of their cancer. And so my goal is to provide them kind of a beautiful life uh, as they, you know, unfortunately, they all know they're dying. So this kind of grim setting is also a place where these teenagers, they kind of get together every midnight and tell scary stories to each other to pass the time. And scary stories actually we act out in the show so even though i play this doctor at the beginning of the show and the end of the show in the middle of the show i might play the devil i might play a detective i might play um a, a cop and so it was a really fun show to do because you have this kind of really sad reality that we all know about in our real lives of you know people who are afflicted with these really you know challenging problems and and how do you face death you know it's really such an interesting show because we all love watching death we all love watching killing but actually to really be face to face with real death in our own lives is always so devastating and um and i really really loved playing this part because the message is sometimes you know just living a day-to-day -day life is is the best that you can do when you know you you know your your life isn't going to be very long and and so that's the message that I gave as that doctor. But the most fun I had on the show is actually playing the devil, which if anybody saw that episode, yeah. I got to play the devil, and it was so much fun. Um, we only got to do one season of the show. I think unfortunately, Mike Flanagan changed his contract from Netflix over to Amazon right at that time, and probably Netflix thought, nah. He's not sticking around, so I don't think we'll give this show a second year. But I do think there were lots of plot lines that we were looking forward to completing. So I did that, and then last year I also worked for Mike Flanagan again on a film called Life of Chuck, which is written after a novella by Stephen King, and that'll be coming out in the fall. And I get to play, it's a one scene part, but it was super fun, and uh, I, I play just an old lady, basically. <laughs> And uh, I'm looking forward to playing more old ladies in my, you know, as I get older. You know, speaking of novellas, the, was the Midnight Club initially based on the Christopher Pike books, or no? Yeah, yeah, so the Midnight Club are based on the 1990 Christopher Pike novels. He had 34, maybe 40 of them. And Mike Flanagan bought the rights to all of them. Really? And so he still owns the rights to these books, and I keep thinking, like, maybe he'll 
He'll do more of them. They, they, they were really, really fun to enact. Oh, and then the, there's another movie that is coming out this year called Little Bites that's by Spider Fox. I mean, I'm sorry, Spider One, and his wife Chrissy Fox plays the lead, and I, I play a mysterious woman in that movie as well, and it's pretty good. I just saw it. It's, it's, it's amazing. Okay. Yes. Uh, which side of the camera do you prefer to be on? You two have done work on both. So which one do you feel like is the most rewarding for you? Well, I mean, I I have to say working behind the camera is probably my favorite. I, I've, I've directed a few little shorts. Um, I did a short called Washed Away, and um, I got a little bit of experience like working behind the camera as a director. Um, it's online, I think, on Vimeo or something like that. You can see that. Um, it's about actually grief, and it's about when people die and what happens to them, what happens to their spirits. Um, I always think that grief is like the flip side of horror. We all like really love being scared, but we don't really get the, as good at dealing with grief because like we're really good at dealing with horror and blood and guts and all that kind well, of stuff. We know it's fake. Yeah, you know it's fake, but yeah, but the movies don't really deal with it either. So I thought, well, I'm just going to write a little horror movie that talks about uh, the, the flip side of horror. And, and so I enjoy that so much that I'm really looking for other opportunities to be able to direct little little featurettes or little short films. Yeah. You. Oh, oh, wow. oh with a hat back there. <laughs> hey, uh, your favorite memory from working with Patricia Arquette, and have you seen her recently after? I think the most memorable day working with Patricia was the day that I died, and um, <laughs> in the show, she she was so. I knew that she was a star that day because, you know, it was a very rough shoot. We shot that scene probably one of the very last days, and as an actor, sometimes you feel really rushed because people are just bearing down on you like. Get your shit together, you know, are you in costume, you know, you know, you know. And, and she just told the director, you know, I'm gonna need some time. And she left the set, and we're all like, you know, I'm like laying there with the blood and everything. And it wasn't a long time, but she just knew what she needed to do to do that scene as well as she did it. Because the reason that you guys think that scene is so sad is because Patricia is so, um, She's so devastated, and she's just crying. It's so real, and the reason that that scene is so touching is because of her performance. And so she came back, and it was probably maybe five minutes, you know, and she just gave that performance like one take, bang, and all of us were just like, you just don't get those. You don't get those kinds of performances in horror movies very much. It's really. It's just really rare to have people with real tears, like really giving all their heart like that. And I thanked her because I knew that it wouldn't have been a good scene unless she had done that. And and it, it was very hard to tell the director, like, I'm not ready. You know, very few actors will like be that brave and just say, I need some time. So. I'm just curious, out of all the Elm Street movies, what do you think was the, your favorite or maybe the most creative death? They're all so good. <laughs> How can you pick? They're all so good. But there's really diabolical ones. Like I think the Terror and Death and Nightmare 3 with the hypodermic needles. The thing that to me that one is so heartbreaking is because we know that Taryn had been clean. Like she had worked so hard to get off drugs. She had worked. Like, like that was who she was, you know. And and yet Freddie gets her with that. You know, those are the deaths to me that when they really pertain to the person who they are. And it, their psychological, um, Freddie's undoing everything you've ever done to try to be a better person or try to be a stronger person. He just knows how to like undo it all like in one second and kill you. So that one's heartbreaking to me. Yes. Do you have a favorite story about the uh, last work in the class? Working with Wes was, you know, he was, God, he was such, he was such an interesting person, first of all. So smart, a little intimidating, hard to get to know, and very, um, just, he was so confident in his vision and knew exactly what he wanted. And so after a time, you know, a few couple of days working with him, 
and I was a new actor, I didn't really know what to do. Um, we were outside the jail, and I'm looking inside the jail cell, and you know, Rod is getting strangled, and then I stand up against the bushes, and I'm like creeping away, and then Freddie's in the bushes, and he scares me, and I run off, and so. It was just a lot of technical work. I had to kneel here, stand there, walk there, run there. Lots of direction and lots of, you have to be very precise, you know. And, and you know, you're doing 10 takes, you know. And Wes, after that, he's like, Heather, I just want to tell you, like, what a great job you're doing. And um, rarely do people tell you that, rarely. And, and so it gave me so much confidence. And, Having confidence is like to be Nancy. I really needed it, and and just getting that kind of pep, not pep talk, but just compliment, reassurance, reassurance. Like I wasn't being stupid, and it looked good. You know, he was proud. I think that really helped me go forward and continue to think like, okay, the choices that I'm making, the way of being scared, how to move, what to do with my face, what to do with my hair. All of those things usually cause you a lot of insecurity, but um, yeah, I can just say it's very rare that you get a, like kind of a, like a vote of confidence sometimes in the middle of a scene like that. Uh, and you had one too, right? With your experience behind the camera, um, experience with special effects, and your willingness to play the part again, have you ever thought about creating your own script that you? Oh, you don't think I have? No, yeah, no, I totally have. I have my own idea. But the thing about this Hollywood place is that it doesn't, no matter how hard you try, the forces of the rights, the lawyers, the studios, the family, they're, they're embroiled in so much negotiation and so much... Um, like so much on the business end of creating something that it's really not, it's not really realistic or possible to think that something that I would think of would probably rise to their attention. I think. You of all people though. I know you think that, but believe me, I mean, we're just the actors, you know, they really do think we're expendable. And, and even nowadays, you know, with all the superhero movies and everything, it's like people are looking for such big concepts and such big ideas, and you know, it, it has to be universal, and everyone in every country has to want to see it. You know, their their goals are just so amazing. Like a simple plot, you know, I just feel like it wouldn't satisfy the kind of movie that they're dreaming of creating. But who knows? They might call me up, and I have it ready. I have my idea ready. Um, so, kind of along those lines, um, Godzilla Minus One just won visual effects a couple weeks ago yeah. on a $15 million budget, yeah. and I think there's discussion now about Hollywood maybe taking smaller stories and bringing those to the screen, so what I hope that that's true, because the reason that Nightmare on Elm Street is a classic is it was a movie that wasn't made with a committee. There was no, you know... Uh, vice president of development looking how we can market toasters, you know, and it's like a lot of people put their two cents in now to try to get a movie massaged in a way that they think is advantageous, but truthfully, the classics come from one man who has a producer who really believes in him, who gives good ideas, but doesn't like, you know, tie him up with, you know, with too many, too many requirements. And Wes Craven and Bob Shea just had such a great relationship in the Nightmare One uh, scenario that we literally would be planning shots that day. And nowadays, they just, everything has to be so pre-planned, everything, you know, there's so much prep and it kind of kills a lot of that originality. And, like some of the things on the fly that we did, I think are the best scenes, like uh, Freddie coming through the ceiling totally on the fly that day. Uh, the bathtub scene totally on the fly. I mean, we they had created the set for the bathtub, but we had never rehearsed. We had never he didn't he had a two by four for me to sit on and like you know propped in there, and they had some bubbles going over there, and like it was not well planned. And the spontaneity of it is what made it so amazing, you know. 
the, the, the Glenn scene and the rotating rooms, those scenes were planned because they really involved a lot of construction. We were on a, a room that was rotating, so that had to be, you know, that was like the set piece of the whole movie. And, and so those scenes, you know, were really, really planned out. But a lot of those scenes were not very well rehearsed at all. Before we wrap up, do we have Amy in the back? It's been in the front a lot. Yes. It's really sad. Um, so, as you know, the Lubbock Babes were this fabulous singing group at the pizza parlor. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so as you know, we used Sweeney Todd. We had um, all sorts of songs from all over the Songbook of America. And those rights to those songs were for like an airing of a TV show and maybe two, um, you know, uh, replays. And so now with streaming services, those rights are not um, available, except for apparently they cost so much money, they're prohibitively expensive to get that right for playing Sweeney Todd for streaming forever. And so the producers, or the, whoever at Warner Brothers who owns the show, is like, it's just not worth paying all that money for all those songs and uh, for streaming. And unfortunately, I think that that will continue unless there's some new model for paying for rights for songs. And, you know, I always think like, with all of the blockchain and everything that's going on, it just seems to me possible to create some new model where, where these rights can be paid in perpetuity, but you don't have to like, upfront lay down millions of dollars. And who knows, perhaps they're working on it. Unfortunately, they could recut all the shows so there's no songs. And it would still be kind of cute show, but you wouldn't have a love of babes. And you and the hat had one wrapping it up. Actually, it's kind of strange because you said a question about the ten of us, and I was going to ask a different question. Okay, do it. I was going to ask you if uh, Jeff does when he would come on the show. Well, so Brooke Thies is a really good friend of mine. She lives in Los Angeles, so I see her, and she's also a nightmare folk person, so I see her on these uh, trips to cons. And then uh, Joanne Willette is a really good friend. She has moved out of town, though, so I don't see her as much. Um, Bill Kirkenbauer lives in Thailand, so I haven't seen him for ages. But um, Deb Harmon I see from time to time. And then Jamie Lunar, um, you know, she's a really good friend, but she lives in Bulgaria, and she's a producer over there and makes movies. So don't see her very often either. But Matt Shackman I see. You know, incredible career he has. Um, he directed all the, a lot of House. He did, you know, uh, the Wanda. Um, WandaVision. WandaVision. Of course, I think he's had a couple Marvel movies under his belt. So he's probably the most like superstar of all of us. And, and whenever I see him, he also is the artistic director of the Geffen Theater in Los Angeles. So he is a serious. He really is a serious dude and loves theater. Yeah. Wow. Well, to wrap us up, you have spent the majority of your career scaring us all to death. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, in movies and various TV shows, what scares you in movies? You already said creepy, you're not a fan. Creepy, weird kids. <laughs> creepy, we just had the Children of the Corn kids. Yeah, that movie is like probably. If you want to scare me, you show me something like that where kid, twisted kids doing like weird things. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because you know you always think your kids would be like this perfect like you know child, and then and then you see that oh, like Damien and the Omen three. Oh my gosh, or Damien and the Omen. Those movies, I love those movies. Such good. Movies. Yeah, such good movies. So good. Good. So that's what I like. Everyone, give it up. Ashlyn? Yes. Yeah, you have everyone that you do. Pretty much. Oh, that's so great. So normally it's a selfie. It's a, I have my friend here. You like it? I love it. Good. Thank great. you very much, Heather. All right. Thank you. Great job. Thank you As very always. much.